Well, this is the first Sunday in December, and uh, that means that Christmas is not only just around the corner, but there's a wedding that's just around the corner as well. And uh, we are very excited for Ben and Hannah, and the only thing that could give us greater joy would be to have the honor of your presence, all of you, celebrating their day with us. But of course... (laughs) Plans have been painfully altered, which means that outside of immediate family and the wedding party, uh, most of you will have to join us by live stream, but we most certainly hope that you will. We really do. Uh, We want you to, um, to join us and to share in our joy, and I can't emphasize how much uh, how, how broken-hearted we are to not have all of you personally with us on January 2nd. You know, I believe that Jesus uh, rejoices with us in all that he is doing in Ben and Hannah's lives. And I also believe that Jesus grieves with us because weddings among God's children are for the whole family of God. They are. And in fact, today in Matthew 22, we're going to hear... Jesus tell a parable about a wedding with an unlimited guest list. And I have to tell you, I've struggled a bit with jealousy. <laughs> Not only because uh, this king didn't have to deal with COVID-19, but, but also because there was nothing to limit his resources in having every person he wanted at the wedding feast, or to, to, to at least to invite everyone he wanted to the wedding feast of his son. So turn with me now to Matthew 22 this morning, Matthew 22, verses 1 through 14. This is the third of three parables, a trilogy of parables that Jesus has told about the kingdom of God. Today we're going to bring this, kind of kind of wrap up this little section here, Matthew, and we're going to see what Jesus has to teach us by way of a wedding parable, Matthew 22, verse 1. Jesus told them again a parable, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And he sent out his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding feast, and they were unwilling to come. Again, he sent out other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fattened livestock are all butchered. And everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went their way. One to his own farm, another to his business. And the rest seized his slaves and mistreated them and killed them. But the king was enraged sent out his armies and destroyed those murderers and set their city on fire. And he said to his slaves, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main highways, and as many as you can find there, invite to the wedding feast. Those slaves went into the streets and gathered together all they found, both evil and good. And the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. But when the king came in to look over the dinner guests, he saw a man there who was not dressed in wedding clothes. And he said to them, to him, excuse me, friend, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. And the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot, throw him into the outer darkness in that place there there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Let's pray and ask God's blessing over the reading of His Word. Father, today we come to the very words of Jesus as He seeks to paint a picture for us, to call us, to beckon us, to be among those who feast with you. So give us hearts to hear, eyes to see. Spirit of God, take these words that Jesus 
so graciously spoke simply to us and enable us to act in faith on them, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. The first thing that I want you to notice about this, uh, at the outset of this parable, is that is the posture of the king. Now we have to do a little bit of uh, Im- Im- implication here, but I want you to notice here that he stands basically with, with open arms, with a large heart, and extends an invitation for many to come and join him for a wedding feast for his son. He invites his people to join him in the joy of honoring his son. He invites his people. Notice here that the king's disposition is one of generosity, hospitality, and benevolence. He's going to spare no expense. He's going to slaughter cow after cow after cow to make sure there will be an oversupply of plenteous food and feasting and he invites you to come the party is on him i want you to notice also the king's patient persistence as he sends out yet a second call in verse four again he sent out other slaves saying tell those who've been invited behold i prepared my dinner my oxen My fattened livestock are all butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the feast, the wedding feast. I want you to notice here two things in this verse. The first is that there's a sense of urgency. (laughs) The food's ready. Don't delay. Come. The feast is now. And the second thing is, is notice how he seeks to entice his guests. I don't know about you, but when I hear about fattened calves... Uh, that sounds really good to me. That means there's a little bit of, a little bit of lard on the, edge of the meat. I don't want any of that lean stuff. I want the good tasting stuff, right? And he makes it apparent. I knew, I knew Jug would say amen if I just went on long enough. Uh, he makes it apparent that there's plenty of food and he wants him to come and, and, and be enticed by this wonderful banquet that he's established, set before them. And yet in verse 5, they pay no attention. Pay no attention. They just go about their usual business, one to his own farm, another to his own business. They would rather go to work. (laughs) Really? They would rather go to work more interested in building their own quote-unquote kingdom than to feast with the king. Now I want you to keep in mind that the invitation has not come from a neighbor. The invitation has not come even from a brother The invitation has come from the king. And an invitation from one's king was not only a distinct honor, but also bore a certain obligation with it. To disregard an invitation or a summons from the king was blatant rebellion. To merely go to work and to pay no attention to the king king summons was to regard him as unimportant, less than common, not worthy of one's attention, let alone one's loyalty. Now, you know, we know right from the outset that Jesus is talking about the kingdom of heaven, so we know that the king here represents God. And so you can see right here how when we go through our lives and we pay no attention, we disregard, we just do our own thing, we mind no attention to God, we say something horrific about what we believe of his worth. Worse yet, in verse 6, we're told that others not only disregarded the king's call, but they seized his slaves, they abused, and they killed them. Now, this is absurd. I mean, to kill the king's slaves was a declaration of war against the king. And this kind of response to a wedding invitation, a royal wedding invitation, is absurd and it's shocking and it's meant to be shocking. Jesus told this story in part for the shock value. Why? Because he's trying to awaken the hearts of the Pharisees in terms of how they are about to reveal their own hearts about the kingdom of God in their treatment of Jesus. He's revealing the deep hostility he knows exists in their hearts. 
And remember here, Jesus is speaking this parable the very week that he would suffer and brutal, uh, the brutal hostility of the Jewish leaders and be crucified. Remember, we've already had Palm Sunday. We're in the midst of Passion Week. Jesus is doing his final teaching, and he's given three parables now about the kingdom of God to the Pharisees, to the religious leaders. He's seeking to awaken their hearts. Notice now in verse 5, the king's dis- disposition has changed, has it not? The king's disposition changes. He is enraged in verse 5. And he enacts his vengeance by destroying those who've murdered his servants and burning their city with fire. An act of war. Keep in mind that Jesus speaks these words in Jerusalem where he as God's ultimate servant will be abused and killed just hours, just within days. And the city of Jerusalem in just a short time, would be burned under the hand of God's judgment in 70 A.D. I don't think Jesus is just saying this by coincidence. Well, according to verse 8, the hostility and the treason of those who killed the king's servants proved them uh, to not only be unworthy guests of honor, but also enemies of the kingdom and thus we see this response from the king uh, this response of of warring against them in the parable those first invited were not worthy because they were unwilling to receive the king's generous offer of honor and friendship they were unworthy because they were unwilling to turn from their own way unwilling to see the significance of what the king was summoning them to. They were unworthy because they repaid generosity with hostility rather than with gratitude. I want to pause here for a moment this morning because I want us to take note that ingratitude is not only the fruit of unbelief, and it is. Ingratitude is also a sign of rebellion against God. God. Ingratitude is a sign of rebellion against God. This is why in Romans chapter 1, the wrath of God was revealed against those who knew the truth about God, but refused to, and I quote, honor him as God or give thanks. They refused to honor him as God. And they refuse to give thanks. You see, ingratitude fails to give God His proper place of honor, and it reveals a heart of rebellion toward Him. And that's precisely what's happening in this parable in Matthew 22. Now, verses 8 to 10, the the king persists. I want you to notice here, he will not give up on his passion, and his purpose to honor his son. This is really important. And so he sends out his slaves with a new invitation. Look at verse 8. Then he said to his slaves, the wedding is ready. And those who were invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main highways, and as many as you find there, invite to the wedding feast. And those slaves went out into the streets and gathered together all they found, both evil and good, And the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. What's the king's disposition now? It's changed again. What is it? Now his disposition is one of enlarged generosity. Enlarged generosity. He invites all who are willing to come indiscriminately. He invites them to come. And the wedding hall is filled with a motley crowd. A motley crowd. People of both good and reputation. Wow. Imagine how pleasantly surprised these guests must have been. Knowing they're undeserving. They're not in the high class. Knowing they're undeserving yet invited. What an honor. This is what the kingdom of God looks like, beloved. It is filled with people pleasantly surprised by grace. That's the kingdom of God. 
a people gratefully surprised by grace, knowing they're undeserving of any honor, yet recipients of God's good favor. Church, look around you. Look. You can look with a mask. Look around you, right? Look around you. Are we not a motley crew? Are we not in the great banqueting hall of our King? We are all kinds. All kinds. Some known for decades of integrity and be morally outstanding and others with checkered backgrounds and all kinds that we gather together surprised by grace, grateful for mercy. See, in light of this parable, I want you to consider the words of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Listen carefully. Do you not know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers shall inherit the kingdom of God. That is, what he's saying here is, Paul is saying, those who persist in rebellion against God, just going their own way, doing what they want to do, will not inherit the kingdom of heaven because they persist in their rebellion against God the King. But Paul's not done yet. Paul goes on to say, listen carefully, such were some of you. Such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. I love this verse because Paul, Paul goes out of his way to be grammatically redundant. He uses the word but three times. But you were washed. But you were sanctified. But you were justified. Such some of you were. What does that mean? It means that we can gather together in the great banqueting hall of God, a motley crew, surprised by grace. Surprised by grace. You see, those who are willing to come are made worthy by the King Himself. They're made worthy by the King Himself, clothed in the righteousness of His Son. Now, I know that not all of that is in Matthew 22, but we're filling it out a bit here from the rest of the New Testament, aren't we? Jesus Himself presents us with wedding clothes. But in verse 11, when the king comes into the banqueting hall to see his motley gathering of guests, his attention is turned to one man who is not properly dressed for the wedding. And when he questions the man in verse 12, notice, when he questions him as to how he got in without proper clothing or clean clothing, the man was speechless. You see that? He's speechless. What does that mean? It means that he had no good answer. He had no reasonable excuse for why he presented himself the way he did at this occasion. You see, it's not that the man was too poor to afford proper clothing. If so, certainly he would have would have expressed that to the king who would have given him mercy. But no, he didn't have a good answer. He was simply unwilling. He was unwilling to give honor due the king. He's come. He's there. Maybe for the food. Maybe for a free meal. I'll take what I can get. But I don't got to do nothing special for that king. Right? He's, he's, he's here. There's all kinds of people like this around us, aren't there? Right? Comes, but rebellion is still bound up in his heart. I will come on my own terms. I don't change for nobody. Got it? Beloved, mere external association with God's people is not enough, to say the least. You must come to God on His terms. That's the point here. 
You must come to God on His terms. And He requires that you give proper honor to His Son. This Father will not stand for someone to dishonor His Son. His Son, the Prince. Don't be deceived into thinking that you can somehow gain points with God by by merely doing external things, by, by merely going to church, by merely doing what Christians are supposed to do while your heart is still foreign to God. You can't truly partake of the benefits of the kingdom while you continue to insist on self-rule, resisting God's rule, and insisting on living your own way. You see, the kingdom of God is home to those who surrender to His righteousness and His kingly rule. So don't be fooled into thinking that while there is a free offer of salvation, there are not obligations that accompany citizenship in the kingdom of God. Repentance, obedience, faith, they do not earn our seat in the banqueting hall but they are the proper means of honoring the Son who freely bestows on us His robe of righteousness. Now, to the one who refused the king's terms here in the parable, the king has him bound and thrown into outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. By the way, this phrase is used at least a half a dozen times in the book of Matthew alone. And every single time, this language is a picture of final judgment. Final judgment. The torment of being cast out of God's favor. The divine judgment of hell is the final destination to those who willfully disregard, rebel, and war against God and His Son, even if it's by mere disregard. The divine judgment of hell is the final destination for those who appear religious in their external behavior, but whose hearts refuse to surrender their self-rule to give Jesus His proper place of honor as Lord and King. And so Jesus concludes in verse 14, That many are called, but few are chosen. Many are called. The invitation has gone out to all people indiscriminately, but few are chosen. Well, the question this morning then is, how do you know if you're one of God's chosen ones? How do you know? Well, the chosen are those who willfully embrace God's terms of giving proper honor to His Son in their heart and in their life. They gladly receive His invitation knowing they are unworthy and bearing the fruit of repentance in a new life of obedience to Jesus Christ. Now I want to step back for a minute and look, kind of look at the big picture with you if I, can, if I can this morning. Remember here that Jesus is speaking to the Jews. Is He not? That's the context. He's speaking to the Jews. Israel has been invited and they were being called to honor God's Son as their Messiah and their heavenly King. But they rejected God's call. They rejected His Son, resulting in judgment against that generation. But God, in His generous hearted mercy, extended His invitation indiscriminately to all who would willingly come and honor His Son. And consequently, what do we have? We have a new chosen people. People recognized by their willingness to embrace God's terms, to embrace Jesus as their prince and king. A people willing to bear the fruit of repentance. And that group is what we call the church. Now, let's widen the lens a little bit further. In terms of the context here in Matthew uh, and, and take a, a, little bit, a little bit broader look here. Because, as I mentioned earlier, this is the third of three parables. It's a trilogy of parables. They kind of work together. And, you know, I don't know, maybe I could have preached them all on one Sunday, but you probably would have been happy with me. So, <laughs> I try, 
we tried to break them down. Uh, actually, the reason I broke them down is because it took me a week on each one of these to figure out how to understand them <laughs> well. But anyway, here we have this third of three consecutive parables confronting the Jewish leaders about the kingdom of God. They're all about the kingdom of God, and they're all about confronting the Jewish leaders. And these parables are given in response to the Pharisees' offense. Their offense that was taken at Jesus' authority. Think back with me. Chapter 21. They were indignant that the people sang Hosanna as Jesus rode into Jerusalem. Remember that? They were indignant by that. Indignant that the children should sing in the temple to Jesus. They were indignant that Jesus overturned the tables of the money changers in the temple. They were indignant because Jesus did not bow to their ter- terms and to their traditions. But in reality, as these parables explain, the Pharisees have failed to bow to God's terms of true righteousness. You see, in the first parable, the Pharisees were the son who said he'd go to work in the vineyard, but never went. He never went. And Jesus told them that sinners who had at first refused to do God's will, but later repented, would would inherit the kingdom of God, while the Pharisees would forfeit the kingdom for persisting in not doing God's will, not embracing God's terms. And so he says, tax tax collectors and prostitutes will get into the kingdom of God ahead of you because they have repented. And they've turned to honor. In that context, John the Baptist, his message of repentance and Jesus. In the second parable, the Pharisees rejected Jesus as the cornerstone, just as the wicked tenants killed the landowner's servants and his son. Do you remember that? And so the Pharisees would forfeit the kingdom and be crushed by this cornerstone because they rejected God's chosen one and they rejected God's terms of repentance, the true way to bear fruit for God. In the final parable, the Pharisees refused God's terms of honoring the Son. They refused the invitation to come to the wedding, and they forfeit God's kingdom only to inherit eternal torment. Now, do you see the pattern? There is a very clear pattern. By refusing God's terms of giving proper honor to His Son, in every parable, they forfeit the kingdom of God for eternal torment destruction so here's what we should conclude from today's parable in its context because those who reject god's gracious invitation will fall under his judgment we must respond to the urgency of god's call and enter the kingdom on his terms what are god's terms Turn from your own way. Turn from your self-preoccupation. Turn from your self-rule. And honor Jesus. Give Jesus proper honor as Lord and King. You might ask the question this morning, why is it such a big deal? Why, Why is it such a big deal to honor the Son? And to honor Him to such an extent that I, that, that, that I give him the right to rule over my life, that's kind of a big deal. Why? Because Jesus lived the only earthly life of true righteousness. And he died as the only sacrifice that could pay for your sin. And so he's the only one that can reconcile you to God. He's the only one. He's the only one that can prevent you from being thrown out of the wedding hall to the place of outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. And those who receive him as the payment for their sin and the king of their life receive his robe of righteousness that fits them for the kingdom of heaven. So, you know, you can continue to live your life of self-rule. You can do that. 
but know where it leads. Or you can surrender all of your self-rights to Jesus and inherit the kingdom of heaven. Beloved, the reality this morning is that God extends an invitation to you. A royal invitation. You are invited. Your presence is requested. God extends an invitation that will, it will interrupt your self-directed life. Weddings have a way of taking up your whole day. Weddings have a way of interrupting your self-directed life, but you receive an invitation that will deliver you from sin's ultimate ruin and replace it with God's eternal joy. And this morning, the Spirit of God calls. The invitation has gone out. The invitation is the Gospel. It has gone out. The sacrifice has been made. Christ has laid down His life. And now the Spirit of God calls you to come on God's terms to leave your own way and to honor the Son with His proper place in your life. Let's take a moment to pray this morning.